Good morning. Good morning. I want to read to you two verses out of Luke. Chapter 4, this is verse 31 and 32. If you have your Bibles, please turn there. Uh, you can keep a finger there because we'll be spending most of our time in this chapter. In verse 31, God's word says this. And he, this is Jesus, went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee. And he was teaching them on the Sabbath, and they were astonished at his teaching. For his word possessed authority. <laughs> Let's pray for our time again, really. Heavenly Father, as I have a chance to talk about you, I pray that you would speak through me, your spirit would speak through me, God, and that you would reach these people with what they need to hear today. God, I pray that your spirit would go out before me and soften hearts and open up ears, God, and help those who are in a place of spiritual blindness see. God, that your enemies are all around us, and I pray that you use this time to sharpen us and make us ready for the spiritual battle that rages on. Mm -hmm. Lord God, we trust this time to you, and we worship you in this very act of studying your word together. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Let me ask you all an important question. What have you done this week to spread the gospel? Now, if you're not a Christian here today, you're off the hook. You don't have to answer this one. <laughs> But if you claim to be a Christian, what have you done this week to spread the gospel? Be honest with yourself for a moment. I hope with all my heart that if we went person to person around this room, we would hear one story after another of how God's saints are being his hands and his feet and spreading the good news to a lost and dying world that needs to hear it. That's what I hope we would hear. What I'm afraid is that if we went from person to person around this room, what we would hear is one excuse after another of why we are choosing not to do the most important thing we could do with our lives. I want everyone to be the kind of person who is a gospel preacher rather than an excuse maker. See, I want you, if you are an excuse maker, to feel guilty and ashamed of yourself for not doing something that is so important because you are treating the most beautiful gift you have ever received as if it is trash. I want you to feel guilty because that's how I feel when I catch myself doing it. For many of you, if I asked you this question, if I asked you, well, would you die for Jesus Christ? In a moment, you might say, of course I would, absolutely. So then my question becomes this to you. If you claim you would die for Jesus, then why aren't you living for him? Amen. Today I want to speak to you about the gospel. Today, as we look at God's word together, you need to ask yourself a very important question, which is, do you really love the gospel? Or not? If you really love the gospel... 
then there is a certain way you will live that won't be like other people. There are certain things you will say that non-gospel lovers would never say. There are certain things you won't do because you know that's not how God wants you to live. See, what I'm worried is today you will find out that deep down you don't really love the gospel after all. You might find out that you're fond of the gospel. Or maybe you'll find out that you don't even really know the gospel. There are three truths about this gospel, the gospel that we're called to preach, that we need to look at together today. And we're going to get these truths right out of Jesus' ministry. Jesus is the one who is our great example. And if we want to learn how we ought to do our ministry, maybe we can ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? As cliche as that sounds. <laughs> I'm going to reread that verse that I just read a moment ago, the two verses, Luke 4, 31 through 32 for you. It says, and he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teachings, for his word possessed authority. See, we know that Jesus had just come from Nazareth from his hometown where he preached to them and he was rejected. Mm -hmm. And from there he comes to Capernaum and he preaches and these people are amazed by the way that he preaches. They're amazed with the authority that he taught unlike the way the rest of the rabbis taught in this day and age. See, normally if you were to go to a synagogue and you were to try and talk uh, to one of the rabbis, maybe they were giving their message. Here's what it would sound like. The rabbi would read the passage and then they would tell you, well, this rabbi said this and this and this, and this rabbi thought this and that. And all they would do all day long is give you what other rabbis said, and they would never give you their own opinion. They would never tell you what you were supposed to do with the word of God. They didn't tell you how to live based on God's word. All they give you, gave you was rabbi's opinion after rabbi's opinion. And that's not what Jesus did. When Jesus showed up, what he did was he went. He took a scroll from the Old Testament. And from that scroll, scroll he spoke, spoke to them with authority. He spoke to them, telling them the things they must do, telling them the things they must not do. He spoke to a crowd of spiritually dead men, and he told them what they need to have life. Jesus told them they needed him. Here is the first truth. <clears throat> We need to learn from this ministry. The gospel needs to be preached with authority. Now, <clears throat> what I do up here, it's, it's not maybe the same way that you all are going to preach. Not everyone here preaches from a pulpit. You each have a job. How you do that job will preach the gospel. But it's not just how you do that job, it's also what you say in that job. Because you also need to use words, is what we're going to see in a moment. When you preach the gospel in your own position in your life, well, what do those who are in your lives say? Now, one question you need to maybe ask yourself is when is the last time you actually sat down and shared the gospel with someone in your life? Why has it been so long for some of you? 
Is it because you're not sure if you believe in your heart that you have authority from God to do this? We are to preach the God uh, to preach the gospel with authority. Is the problem for you that you're not really sure if Jesus is the only way? And so you're hesitant to tell people about that. Do you speak to people believing that the God of this universe has actually given you the ability to save souls with his gospel? Amen. See, this world is full of religions. And I want to ask you, when you preach to other people, do you preach believing you actually have the truth, the truth about this world, or are you uncertain still? And I want to be clear with you. Those other religions in this world, if you are going to preach the gospel, you have to have the full conviction that in comparison with the one and only true gospel, they are garbage. Compared to the gospel of Jesus, it is that beautiful. Do you believe that when you preach to the people in your lives? I have an ask, a question for you, and maybe this will help illustrate my point. How many of you have seen maybe the movie Schindler's List? Some of you. For those of you who haven't seen Schindler's List, it follows the true story of a German industrialist named Oskar Schindler. Now, he used his factory during World War II to save more than a thousand Polish Jewish lives from the Holocaust. How the movie shows this is the movie shows Oskar Schindler from time to time throughout the movie, giving away his fortune, trying to bribe various Nazi officials to get these Jews out of going to Auschwitz and instead coming to work at his factory. And by the end of the movie, we see that Oskar Schindler has spent his entire Fortune, his entire savings, everything he has on this endeavor. And he runs out of money just as World War II ends and the Germans surrender. And then there's this powerful scene at the end of the movie where he's with all these people. He saved over a thousand of them. And all of a sudden, he just starts breaking down in tears because he can't stop thinking about how he could have done more he looks at his car and he says why did I keep this car I could easily have gotten 10 more lives if I had sold it he, he looks at a gold pen that he kept in his shack he says, this is gold this, is, this could have gotten me another life and he just keeps breaking down in tears, saying, I could have done more. I could have done more. And it's a powerful scene, and I'll never forget when I first saw that scene, because <laughs> I thought of myself and wondered, is that how I will feel on the day I stand before the Lord? Am I going to break down in tears over every life I could have done more to save. One day you are going to stand before the almighty God who created everything. And on that day, what will you say to him about those lives you chose not to preach the gospel to? Are you going to start coming up with excuses? I'm sorry, I, I would have told them about the gospel. But see, there's a rule at work where we don't talk about these things. 
I'll sound pretty pathetic in that moment. Maybe your excuse sounds slightly different. Well, God, I, I really valued their friendship. I, I didn't want to offend them. I didn't want to offend their culture. I feel like all views are equal. Tell that to them when they're in hell. Mm. Or was it going to sound even more pathetic? Well, God, I just, I, I just didn't feel led, you know? I mean, that just wasn't my ministry. <laughs> Those excuses are going to sound pretty stupid. When the people you claim to have loved are cast into that unquenchable fire and they burn for all eternity. Because that's what's at stake here. You have to understand that. As human beings, we are sinful human beings. We have rebelled against God who is perfect. And because of our sinful rebellion, you and I have earned hell. A hell that separates us from God's grace for all eternity. And that is not a comfortable thing to hear. And when you reject the gospel, his gift that saves you from that. When you have it, but don't share that, what's that say about you? About your faith? Jesus preached with authority because all authority had been given to him. He died on the cross to save wretched humanity and pay that debt that we could never pay for ourselves. We need to preach with the authority of Jesus. When you share the gospel, you need to believe that it's true, that it's the only thing that can save people. And if you really believe that the gospel has the power to save souls, then why would you hide it? If you don't believe the gospel has the power to save souls, then you don't believe it. Let's look at our next truth about the gospel. Truth number two. You need to love the people to preach the gospel to them. Jesus does this really well as we continue on in the section of scripture. Looking back at the scripture, we pick up in verse 33 of chapter 4 of Luke. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And, he re and reports about him went out into every place into the surrounding region. Continuing on in verse 38, we read this. And he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill and with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had, were sick with various diseases were brought to him, and he laid hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not let them speak, because they knew he was the Christ. Notice, if you will, at first glance, 
what we might look over is the fact that this demon that Jesus first addresses is in the midst of the synagogue with all the other good Jewish guys. <laughs> Demons will come in the midst of us. We can expect it. <coughs> and they will sneak in. Now some of you, you might not even really believe in the demonic realm. After all, that seems like something of an older time, an older age. It was a superstitious thing before we became modern and enlightened. Mm -hmm. And if that's how you think, you are a fool. I'm sorry. That's chronological snobbery. As C.S. Lewis put it. Jesus here, he knows his enemy. He confronts the demonic. There are some people who proclaim that they're Christians and they will comment on this passage and say, well, Jesus didn't really know that demons aren't real, so he was just a man of his times. And it's like, who do you think you are that you can judge Jesus yeah. and tell Jesus that he doesn't know what he's talking about in the spiritual realm? How foolish can you be? If we look at Jesus, the man who raised for himself up from the dead, if there is anyone we should trust about spiritual matters, it's that guy. Amen. And if he says they're real and a real threat and a real enemy, then you and I need to realize that that's true for us. I want to quote something, though, because it's important for us to keep something in mind. This is a C.S. Lewis quote from his book, The Screwtape Letters. He says, there are two equal and opposite errors into which we, uh, which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve their existence. The other is to believe and feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. So you need to be careful when we are talking about the demonic. We do need to acknowledge they're real, but we need to understand they are limited. They are not like God. They are not omnipresent. They are not all-knowing. Amen. These demons are limited in how uh, their numbers even. When we talk about the fall of Satan and the demons, said that one third of the angels fell and became demonic. We don't have anything about them continuing to fall. There's nothing about them procreating and making more demons. There's a limited number of demons. Thank you, Lord. Yes. In the battle between good and evil, a lot of the times, we like to blame everything on Satan and the demons. Right. Now, don't get me wrong. They are out there. They are doing things. But oftentimes, we blame them for things that's really just our fault. That's true. That's true. Let me tell you something. <laughs> if in your sinful life, you are pursuing the things of this world, ignoring the things of God... And in truth, ruining your life, right. Satan doesn't need to spend his resources to harm you more than that. Wow. To be candid, you've taken care of yourself. Wow. Just consider that. Mm. We need to acknowledge the real, but we also need to acknowledge that not everything that goes wrong is from demo the demonic realm. Right, right. Oh, now, I will say, this is an example of Jesus loving this man, this demon-possessed man. Because Jesus loves the man and wants to free him from the demon. You know what bugs me? I'm worried that if this demon-possessed man walked into most churches in this country today, you know what they would say? I am pretty sure they would just say, you're perfect the way you are. We're not here to judge you. We just want to help you live your best life now. And they would be uh, all encouraging and not even acknowledging the clear evil that needs to be addressed. I think you need to understand 
Jesus shows his love here because Jesus sees a man who is in desperate need of help, and Jesus comes to his aid. That's so important to our understanding of this story. It was Jesus' love for this man that he would not leave him the way he is. If you know someone struggling in, with a sin in the church, why would you do this, uh, that to them? Why would you say, oh, that sin's their problem. I'm not going to interfere. Mm -hmm. They might or might not have a demon. You may or may not encounter a demon. And you should know that if you do encounter a demon and you are a Christian, you have, because the Holy Spirit is inside you, the authority to cast it out. Amen. You have that authority. But don't think that your role is only for when you see demons. When you see trouble in the lives of the people around you, it is your job to step up, to help out, to interfere, to save people. Now, that might look different based on the situation, but hopefully you will recognize when there's a need you can meet and your need to step in and love someone, even if it's not what they want, but you know it's what they need. Next in the story, Jesus goes to the house of Simon, also known as Peter. You're all familiar with Peter, the apostle. And it says Peter's mother-in-law was ill, which means Peter was married. So if you're formerly Catholic, that might be an issue for you. <laughs> they, they have a belief against that, but it's, it, this is pretty much proof against that. Peter was married. Peter's mother-in-law was ill. Jesus sees her physical need and he heals her. Here he gives another example of how he loves people. In fact, he heals her so completely, she gets up and starts making dinner for everyone. I mean, if you've just come out of a sickness, for most of us, you're pretty exhausted. The last thing you want to do is make dinner for a house full of people. Am I right? I wonder if when she got healed, if she was tempted to say, stay in bed, Oh, well, it was mostly good. I'll just rest my eyes for a moment. <laughs> but no, she gets healed. She, she then feels the compelled need to serve in the way that she has just been served. Amen. Hallelujah. It's beautiful. And Jesus, in his love, sees this need and he meets this need because he's able to. Right. Remember, the whole gospel is happening here. We need to remember that the entire gospel happens because God loves people. Thank you, Lord. That's right. This is important because if we are trying to share his gospel, we need to love people too. Yep, Lord. There would be no gospel if God didn't love people. And the gospel does not get shared if we don't love people. And loving people isn't just about what we say to people, but it's also how we show people our love by meeting their needs. Now, here I need to take a moment and talk about this, because I think this could be a real need for us as a body, as a church. You need to love people by actually meeting needs. This is a part of spreading the gospel. Right? In our church, why is it that so many weeks, JP is the only one who shows up on Tuesday night to pray for the church? My Lord. Don't you realize that's a ministry need we have is to pray for people, right. to care about people, to love people? Why is he so alone so often in praying for the people here at this church? I know some of you are free on Tuesday nights and you could come. Some of you have work, and that's okay if you can't make it. But there's a need here. If you want to be a part of the gospel, yeah. you need to meet that need. Yes. There are people 
here that, well, you like to be backseat participants in church. You like to come. If the message is good, maybe you'll keep coming. And you've become consumers in church, where it's all about what you get out of the message. And if I get enough out of it, maybe I'll come back more. Wow. And you miss the point of being a part of a church. This isn't about what you can come and take from us. This is about what you come and give and be a part of for us. Right. Yes. Now, not too long ago, this church had a picnic. Why was Ken setting up for four hours by himself for a picnic that was supposed to be for the whole church? I know some of you had work, and that's, that's a valid excuse. But some of you had a free morning that morning. And you could have come, and you chose not to come and help. Why? There was a need. A need for spreading love, showing people the gospel. Right. And we chose not to step up there. It's sad. There are ways I do see our church stepping up and meeting needs. Laura and I just had a baby. A lot of you have stepped up in a big way and provided food for us in this time. And that's been a huge blessing. And I love seeing that. But I want to see that in more places in this church. There are real needs. And these needs don't just stop at our church. There are needs in this world around us, in the city of Longmont. But if we can't even meet our own needs within the church, how do we ever expect to grow out and go meet more people's needs and grow this church and spread the gospel in our actions? Right. This is a part of it. In James <laughs> chapter 2, verse 14, he says this, and I want to read it to you. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Right. Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? Right. So also faith by itself if it does not have works, is dead. But some will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Amen. You believe that God is one and you do well, uh -huh. but even the demons believe and stutter, shudder. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? If you really love someone, you will share the gospel with them. If you see a need of theirs that you can meet, that same love will compel you to meet that need. Amen. I want you to ask yourself. In fact, better not better than that, ask God, how can I use what you've given me to meet the needs here? Can I give more of my time? Can I give more of my money? Can I give more of anything to meet other needs so that the gospel can be shared? Now, sharing the gospel happens both in words and deeds. This is never just one or the other. I'll never forget a mission trip I was on in college to Guatemala with a church group that I should never have joined. We spent a week building homes from some, for some locals in Guatemala in the mountainous region. Now, I will be honest. Never in my life have I been more disappointed with the obvious lack of faith I saw in the people with me. Here was a group of Americans that had no desire to actually bring the gospel 
of Jesus to these people. These Americans just wanted to play superheroes for a week. They only went on that mission so that they could brag about how good of Christians they were. Not once in that whole week did I hear a single person on the team try and share the gospel with anyone in that country. It was tragic. I'll never uh, forget that there was morning devotionals and we signed up to lead different days. On the day I signed up to lead, and I'm going to be honest, every other devotional day was very pathetic, and I can talk to you about that more later. But the day I signed up to lead, I started off the teaching and said, hey, for all of you, please open up your Bibles to 1 Timothy. Well, half of them had to go get their Bibles because they thought, well, I don't need my Bible. So they went off, got their Bibles, came back. And then I watched for five minutes as one after another, they struggled to find the table of contents oh, to then right. go find 1 Timothy because none of them had ever used this Bible that they apparently said they believed. I was disgusted. And one thing that I always took that I took away from that that I'll always think of when I think back to that time was how could this group call themselves missionaries when they had no clue what God's mission was about? That's right. That's right. That's true. They were clueless about the very message they were supposed to be sharing. My point is simple. If you love someone, you will preach them the gospel with words and deeds. Jesus shows the people he preaches to his love when he meets their needs. After Jesus heals Simon's mother-in-law, he spends hours that evening healing one person after another and casting out these demons and meeting these people's needs. This was his ministry. There's another truth we need to understand about the gospel. This is truth number three. In order to preach the gospel, you need to love the gospel. Let me refresh you. So first, our first truth was simple. We need to, the gospel needs to be preached with authority. Our second truth, you need to love people to preach the gospel to them. Our third truth, in order to preach the gospel, you need to actually love the gospel. Let's read back in the story and see how this is true with Jesus. In verse 42, it says this. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept, them, uh, kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Now, for those of you who don't know, the good news, that's, that's what gospel means. That's where we get the word gospel is from the words good news. Right. Amen. So what Jesus says here is, I must preach the gospel of the kingdom of God to other towns as well. You have to picture the scene. Jesus had just had a very late night of healing. And finally, after all of the people who had gathered out had gone home, we don't know how few of hours of sleep he got before the next morning comes. And before anyone else is up, he sneaks out of the house to be alone with God. And when the people find him, they want to bring him back to the crowd. So he can go on healing and meeting needs. And this seems like a really good thing. You know, he's becoming really popular. Obviously, they like him a lot. It's not like Nazareth where they tried to kill him. <laughs> but Jesus here says no. And why? Jesus remembers that he has a more important mission and purpose. So what Jesus is saying no to is a good thing. Like, it would be good for him to go on healing, to cast out more demons. And that's a legitimately good thing he could have done. 
but he says no to the good thing so that he could do the more important thing. And what is the more important thing? Preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel. That's the more important thing than even miraculous healings and even more than casting out demons. Sometimes we need to remember to say no to good things in order to do the important thing. What does that mean? Right now, there's probably several areas in your life you could be preaching the gospel, but you're saying no to preaching the gospel because of a good reason. Standing in that way. Maybe it's a relationship that you don't want to ruin by making it uncomfortable and bringing up the gospel. And so the good thing, your friendship or relationship with that person, you're putting over the important thing, which is the gospel. Amen, right? I don't know what the good thing is in your life. You need to consider, is there a good thing that's keeping me from the more important thing? But here's the thing about all of this. The gospel is the most important thing, and we have to learn how to love it if we're going to actually share it. Jesus' purpose was to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. So the question for you is, how important is preaching the gospel in your life? There are really two reasons, when it all boils down, just two reasons you and I don't preach the gospel when we should. First off, it's because we don't love the people enough. Second off, it's because we don't love the gospel enough. Those are the two reasons. Now, I need to maybe stop us right here for a second. Because I've been talking a lot about the importance of the gospel, but I just need to be super clear. Let's define the gospel right now. Okay. In fact, let me ask you a question. If, let's pretend that I had you define the gospel. In fact, let's pretend that I had a pop quiz after church today. I was going to line you all up outside my office one by one. I was going to ask you, come on in. All right, tell me the gospel. All right, you're dismissed. How many of you, and I don't, it's okay, you can be a little boastful here. How many of you are like, no, I, I would ease that. Show of hands. How many of you feel confident you could tell me what the gospel is? Hopefully. I hope most of you can. Hopefully, most of you would realize that the gospel is the story of how God the Father sent Jesus Christ, his son, right. to become flesh, right. to live a perfect life, right. to suffer and die for poor, unworthy men and women, right. to pay the price of debt we owe to God as sinners. Right. And now because of Jesus' sacrifice and resurrection, we who are, were dead in our sins now have a chance to come to life. Hallelujah. We can be filled by the Spirit of God and live as the adopted children of God forever. forever. Instead of going to hell and being permanently separated from God's grace for all eternity. And all we have to do to receive this salvation is to follow Jesus and obey him for the rest of our lives. That's the gospel. Hopefully, now that you've heard it, we, if I have a pop quiz, most of you could say that back to me. Yes. Yeah. But the question is, do you really love that message or not? Yes. If you really love that message, then you wouldn't be ashamed of it, would you? No. If you really loved that message, then sharing the gospel would never be something you have to do. Right? right? right. 
It would never be a chore. If you really love the gospel, it becomes something you get to do. It becomes the reason you get out of bed in the morning. If you love the gospel, that's what happens in your life. Be honest with yourself. Do you look forward to sharing the gospel as you are right now? Or do you kind of dread it? Maybe if you dread it, you dread it because you're actually ashamed of it. My Lord. Maybe you were fond of the gospel, but you don't really love it like you should. If you dread sharing it, it's because you're ashamed of it. And that's why you don't love the gospel like you should. See, if it was not for the love of God demonstrated through the gospel, I would have absolutely no hope in this life. And nothing to look forward to in death. Right. All that would await me is the very well-deserved wrath of God and eternity in hell. Mm -hmm. God saved me from that. Thank you, Lord. How can I ever be ashamed of the most beautiful gift I have ever been given? Right. If I love the gospel, I will share it every chance I get. Yeah. Some people don't share the gospel because... They don't think it's attractive enough. They decided that they'd better water down those offensive parts. They better focus on the nice sounding words, you know, the love of God, the joy in your life. That's how many, so many false doctrines leak into their theology. Like the doctrines of universalism. And other doctrines that no longer condemn types of sins. And they no longer call Christians to obedience and righteousness. In many churches, you'll find people who call themselves pastors, who call themselves priests, and all sorts of folk who have manufactured for themselves a new and improved version of the gospel without that nasty hell or judgment or obedience parts. They have manufactured gospels that have no power to save sinners only the power to keep them numb from their guilt on their way to hell mm -hmm. only the true gospel has the power to save right. and for that reason it is beyond glorious Hallelujah. desiring to change or hide this glorious beauty of the gospel shows you you don't love the gospel as you should. And perhaps it's because you do not know the gospel like you should. As Christians, it's so simple. If we want to have a ministry like Jesus, our mission on this earth is to love people, to love the gospel, and to preach it with, to them with the authority of God. Amen. As Christians, our mission is to love people, Love the gospel and preach it to them with the authority of God. If you aren't saved today, if that gospel message is a gospel message that you haven't received the good news of, let the Holy Spirit work in your life. Maybe make the decision today that you are tired of walking in that sinful way. That you are ready to receive God's forgiveness. And you are ready to follow Jesus wherever he calls you. If that's you today, don't let today end without coming and talking with me. Amen. Don't do it. If you're serious about wanting the true power of the gospel to change your whole life, and regenerate you and set you free, don't leave without talking with me. For those of you who are believers, is the gospel loved in your life? Do you really love the people that are around you who maybe haven't had the 
chance to hear someone preach the gospel this way to them. Don't worry about how effective you feel at speaking. Don't worry about your skills as an arbiter or as a communicator. Trust that if you're going to spread the gospel, that it has the power to save. That the Holy Spirit, if he is willing, will and can regenerate lost souls. And then be invested here in giving to what we do to share the gospel together. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are bare before you. God, we have so many areas we fall short in. So many times, even as believers, we don't live up to what you've called us to. We repent of this. We ask that your Holy Spirit would help us walk in your way. We ask that, God, you would deliver us from our selfish, self-centered, worldly ways. And every day, you would show us more and more how to walk in your ways, in ways that are pleasing to you. Help us love the people around us, the people who are often hard to love. And help us love them so much that we can't bear the thought of seeing them miss out on a relationship with you. That we can't bear the thought of them being separated from you forever. Help us love them so much that we will throw out anything that's keeping us from sharing your gospel with them. Help us share that gospel with power. Help us share that gospel with authority. Help us share that gospel passionately as the greatest and most beautiful thing we have in our lives. Help us love that gospel, the gospel of Jesus and what he's done and who he is. Help lead us. In your holy name we pray all these things and in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen.